Good morning. I'd like, I'm uh, Steve Cromer, the chair of Aberdeen Area Committee of the IMEKE, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to the latest IMEKE knowledge sharing event on basic drilling and petrophysics. Today's presentation will last about 36 minutes, and then we're going to have about 20 minutes of uh, questions, hoping to finish around about one o'clock. Um, so as we go through the presentation, uh, could you please write any questions you have in the question box, which is available on your screen? Uh, and that would allow us to get a look at them and uh, sort them out before we actually get to the question session at the, the end of the presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce Clefensus Dimitriatis. He's well engineered engineering manager at Sasol. He's an experienced upstream oil and gas professional with drilling completions, field development and project management background. He's currently working for Sasol, based in the UK, overseeing land-based operations in Mozambique. He's previously worked with Shell in the Netherlands, Oman and Brunei, and with Tala Oil in South Africa, Uganda and the UK. Before entering the hydrocarbon industry, he worked as an electromechanical design engineer in the UK and got himself an MEng in mechanical engineering, a PhD in materials from Queen's Mary College in London, and an MBA in the Rotterdam School of Management. He is a chartered engineer, he's a fellow of the IMEC, a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and one of the founding members of the Greek Energy Forum. Please end this if you start your presentation. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, it is about uh, awareness level drilling and petrophysics. Quite relevant for mechanical engineers. Since in, in my career as a drilling engineer, um, I have seen most of, most of the uh, colleagues that I have seen come from a mechanical engineering background. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of drilling, then different rig uh, types and systems, um, phases of a well directional drilling, and then a little bit about formation evaluation. It, is, it will not be very scientific, but uh, um, hopefully you can find it interesting. Uh, so we have been using drilling techniques for various purposes for a very long time. Uh, the first recorded evidence is from China uh, more than 2,000 years ago. In the Sichuan province, they were using a combination of bamboo and rocks to create holes by means of percussion in order to tap into brine aquifers and then extract the salt by evaporating the water with heat. By the third century AD, wells uh, were being drilled to 250 meter depth. Uh, by the 13th century, Marco Polo witnessed mining of oil seeping to the surface in Baku, Azerbaijan. The Yanak Dar, uh, um, this means fire mountain, is active to this date with oil and gas burning day and night. Um, around the same uh, location in the 16th century, oil wells were hand dug to 35 meters, a practice uh, that continued until the 19th century. And that's what you see on the right. Um, moving forward to 1815, oil was produced in the United States for the first time as a byproduct from brine wells used to extract salt. Um, and uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, uh, stream driven percussion rigs were introduced as a technological improvement. In uh, 1846, the first oil well was drilled in Azerbaijan using a rotary rig instead of digging or percussion. So this was rotary. And it was 21 meters deep. This led to oil developments like the Balakani field. Uh, first drilled in 1873, and then developed by the Nobel Brothers, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the well-known Nobel Brothers, from 1875 uh, onwards. In the photos, you can see a depiction from the early days uh, of this oil field with wooden drilling rigs on the skyline, and this is on the left, and the same oil field with steel uh, drilling rigs in 2004 on the right. Um, the first well to strike oil in the USA was drilled by Colonel uh, 
Edwin uh, uh, Drake in 1859. It is claimed to be the birthplace of the petroleum industry, but in, in actual fact, it happened after the first oil well in Baku, which was in 1948, after the first oil well in Europe, which was in Poland in 1854, and after the first oil well in North America, which was in Ontario in 1858. Now, the petroleum era, uh, sorry, the petroleum era was launched in earnest in 1901 uh, with a spindle top gusher. Uh, Captain Anthony Lucas initially drilled to 180 meters before running out of money. He then gained additional funding to continue drilling, and on the first, uh, so on the 10th of January 1901, at a depth of 347 meters. Uh, what became known as the, local, the Lucas Geyser uh, blew over 50 meters in the air uh, at a rate of 100,000 barrels of oil per day. It took nine days to bring under control the largest gasser the world had seen at that point. Uh, I have to say that thankfully today we no longer drill for kicks and know how to drill well safely. Uh, well blowouts do happen occasionally, but serious incidents are very rare. Um, uh, moving on to today, uh, thousands of wells are being drilled per, per year. Each well costs from, let's say, one million to hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on its location and complexity. Uh, the deepest uh, uh, vertical well is just over 12 kilometers deep. It was drilled in the Kola Peninsula uh, of uh, uh, the Soviet Union for scientific research purposes to investigate the earth's crust as deep as possible. Uh, drilling began in 1970 and continued with different rigs over many years. Uh, a number of side tracks were drilled from the original bow. The deepest, called SG3, reached uh, uh, more than 12,000 uh, meters in 1889, and it's still the deepest artificial point on Earth. To put this into perspective, this well depth is more than 14 times the height of Burj Al Khalifa, uh, which is a very tall building, as you know. Um, now, this about depth. Now, what about reach? The world with the longest step out uh, has a horizontal reach of just over 12 kilometers again. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it used to be the O14 production well drilled from the Orlan platform offshore Sakhalin Island in Russia. Uh, this has now been superseded, but not by a lot. As part of the Chavo field development, this well holds two, uh, at the time it held two world records, total measured depth of 13.5 uh, 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 kilometers and horizontal reach of just over 1,000 meters. Uh, to get some perspective, this horizontal re reach is more than the length of 114 football pitches if you take uh, the, a well in the center of London, Piccadilly Circus, it's um, the reach is uh, uh, beyond Stratford or beyond Peckham in the south or around um, uh, Wembley in the west, Wembley Stadium. Um, the, now, the state of the art drilling envelope is represented by a depth versus reach diagram, often called nose plot, due to its shape. Each dot on this plot represents an actual well, its true vertical depth, and its horizontal reach. This diagram is very useful in conveying the current technical limits in well construction. Uh, worth noting, the most challenging wells are not necessarily the deepest or the longest. They are those located close to the external border, formed by the outmost points, which represent what is currently technically and operationally possible. Uh, because the drilling industry is continuously pushing these limits, the shape of this diagram is always changing, of course. Um, now we're moving to drilling rigs. Uh, wells are drilled both on land and offshore. Drilling rigs are purpose-built machines designed to perform certain operations for some types of wells in specific environments. This means that no rig is suitable for all well types. Uh, among other things, rig selection depends on the size and location of each well. Each rig contains uh, some 
basic components that are similar for all rig types, but also has several bespoke pieces of equipment to suit the application. In reality, drilling rigs are more like mobile factories, using uh, oper operating usually 24 hours a day and uh, seven days a week. They are manned by crews of different sizes. It can be five to 100 people. Some work in there permanently, while some others just show up to perform a specific task. Uh, drilling rigs are usually operated by drilling contractor companies. These companies own the rig and employ the drilling crew. Uh, several technical and non-technical services are performed by, uh, on, on, on the drilling rigs by service providers. These are companies uh, that provide spe specialist equipment and people to operate this equipment. The client of the drilling contractor and the service provider is ultimately the operator or the operating company. This company is, is responsible for developing a field and producing hydrocarbons. Um, depending on rig type and market conditions, the day rate for hiring a drilling rig ranges from 30,000 to more than 1 million per day. Uh, now we are showing drilling rigs uh, or land rigs on, uh, on this slide. For land rigs, we use three types. Um, uh, the one on the left is uh, a derrick, a rig with a derrick that looks like a permanent uh, tower. These are usually very powerful, can uh, drill very challenging wells and are suitable for harsh environment, environmental conditions. Uh, they're particularly popular in Russia. Uh, the one on the top right uh, is a rig with a mast that can be raised and lowered relatively easily. These are less powerful rigs, but are usually modular, and all their equipment can be usually packed in 30 to 16 containers, so they're easy to move from location to location. These rigs are particularly uh, popular in Africa. And the one on the uh, uh, bottom right, uh, truck-mounted rigs, which can be even less powerful, but can be rigged up and down very fast and moved even faster. Sometimes their mast can be set at an angle to drill highly deviated shallow wells, and they're particularly popular in Canada. Um, uh, now, moving offshore, for shallow offshore wells, up to 100, 150 meters depth, we use jack-up rigs. All drilling equipment is accommodated on a moving platform, which rests on three legs, with special shoes called spud cans at seabed level. The platform is raised and lowered to suit the water depth. The drilling package is located at one edge of the platform with a cantilever arrangement. In the photo, you can also see the helipad used for transferring people and equipment by helicopter. Uh, helicopters are not used for everything. Supply vessels are also used to support uh, offshore operations. Um, Sometimes drilling packages are permanently installed on fixed uh, uh, or floating platforms. Production or store of facilities may also uh, be present on these structures. Um, for example, on the platform in the picture on the right, the flare boom features prominently. Uh, this is used to burn hydrocarbons produced during well testing operations to assess the productivity of a certain well. Um, moving now deeper offshore, uh, for deeper offshore wells, we use drill ships or semi-submersible rigs. Drill ships are ship-shaped, as the name suggests, and can travel fast during rig moves. In the picture on the left, you can see the heli deck and the dual derricks that allow many operators uh, operations to be performed offline and thus save time, uh, which is a very expensive commodity on these rigs. Uh, while drilling, they are kept in place by thrusters, usually. Uh, and on the right, you have semi-submersibles, uh, um, which have a rectangular shape. Uh, they can be more stable than drill ships, but are slower uh, to move. While drilling, they can be held in place using anchors or thrusters. On the rig, in the picture, one can see clearly the dual derrick and cranes. Now, all rigs have basically the same kind of systems, you know, uh, and we're going to talk about these systems. Uh, one is hoisting. Uh, all rigs use a hoisting system to run tools and equipment inside and outside the wall bore. Uh, how th does this happen? A crown block moves up and down the derrick, which you can see on the right, and the crown block in the middle. 
on the derrick or mast by means of a wire line powered by draw works, which you can see on the left. So this is the hoisting function. We also have the rotating function. Um, now, uh, the rotating action necessary for drilling is achieved in two ways. Nowadays, uh, we use a, a top drive, you can see it on the left, in most rigs, to both lift and rotate pipe by grabbing it from one end. Um, now, on the right, you see how things were done in the past. Um, uh, in the past, the lifting and rotating actions were separate. Lifting was done uh, through a swivel uh, hanging from the crown block. The Kelly, which is a square or hexagonal shaped steel pipe, uh, connected to uh, the swivel to the drill string, and the Kelly moved through the rotary table, a drill floor level, and transmitted torque to the drill string. Today, there are several around rigs that still use this method, especially in the in the States, on land, but they are progressively replaced by top drive rigs. Uh, another function is the circulate circulation. Uh, while a well is drilled, the rig circulating system uh, carries drilling fluid in and out of the well bore. The drilling fluid, also called drilling mud, is the blood of the well because it performs many important functions. Uh, what are these functions? Remove drill cuttings uh, uh, and carry them uh, to the surface where they are separated from the fluid. Uh, control uh, downhole pressure so that it is neither too high or too low. When it's too high, there is a risk of, risk of breaking and destabilizing the formation, while if it is too low, there is a risk of a kick or blowout. Another function is uh, to cool down and lubricate uh, downhole, downhole and surface tools and equipment, and also to power hydraulic tools uh, uh, you know, in the, that are running in the hole. In the schematic, you can also see the mud pump that sends drilling uh, fluid up the standpipe uh, and rotary hose and then to the top of the drill pipe through the swivel and kelly. Then the, um, the, drill, the, the fluid travels down to the drill bit all the way down where it exits the drill string and starts moving upwards in the annulus, uh, carrying the drill cuttings to surface. On surface, uh, the cuttings and drill fluid goes through the sail shakers to separate the cuttings, and then uh, the fluid goes into the mud pit. It is then created uh, so it is then treated further to the rig, to the right specification before the cycle is repeated. Um, now, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the drill string. Now, uh, the drill string is comprised of three kinds of components. The drill bit, the bottom hole assembly, and the drill pipe. Drill bits are located at the very bottom of the drill string and perform two functions, break the rock around them and let drilling fluid circulate through nozzles in their body. There are three different types or there are different types of drill bits depending on the action uh, required to break the rock. And you can see uh, the shape for gouging, the, the, another shape beside it for scraping. Uh, below that you have uh, another shape which is for crushing. And to in the on the uh, bottom left you have uh, a wearing action uh, when you have a very uh, uh, abrasive formation, uh, and this is the the drill bit we use for those. A drill bit can cost from a few hundred to more than hundred thousand dollars. Bit selection depends on many factors, including rate of penetration and durability, uh, and not only the cost of a single unit. Bit optimization looks at finding the cheapest bit in terms of overall cost, considering the price of the bits used and the total rig time spent to drill uh, an interval. The bottom hole assembly uh, uh, often uh, uh, refers to, we often refer to this with the acronym BHA, is located directly above uh, the drill bit and comprises four types of tools, which we're going to see here. Uh, directional drilling tools like mud motors and rotary steerables. Now, this the mud motor creates a directional well bore by rotating the bottom hole assembly and drill bit using the drilling fluid's hydraulic power, while the rest of the drill string rests stationary. So it's powered by the flowing mud. Uh, whereas the rotary steerables, uh, which is the other option, 
uh, performs the same function uh, uh, by directing the bottom hole assembly and drill bit in the desired direction while the drill string is rotating the whole of it with a servo mechanism. It, it, it uh, points it in the right direction. So this is the two uh, kind of tools that help us to drill directionally. Uh, what else is there in the in the um, uh, bottom hole assembly? You have directional measurement tools, mainly accelerometers and magnetometers, measuring inclination and azimuth, and then transmitting this information to the surface using mud pulses. Uh, there are also tools measuring vibration, speed, temperature, etc. Other tools are formation evaluation tools, measuring density, porosities, resistivity, pressure, etc. And there are also mechanical tools reducing uh, vibrations, these are called stabilizers, adding weight, these are called collars, uh, and generating impact forces necessary to free the string when it gets stuck, uh, and these are called jars. Um, now, how, how, uh, what is above this is the uh, drill pipe. Now, the drill pipe has two main functions, to be a pressure conduit for the drilling fluid and to transfer torque from the surface to the drill bit. It should, it should also be able to withstand tension and compression generated by the drilling process. It comes in numerous metallurgical grades, well thicknesses and connection types, to much anticipated loads and well conditions. Most common lengths for a joint of drill pipe is approximately nine meters. Uh, this is called range 2, and uh, it can go to 14 meters, which is range 3. Um, now, we have also casing. Now, the casing should not be uh, confused with the drill pipe because it is a steel pipe that embodies the main structural elements of a well, something like the walls of a building. It comes in multitudes of size, grades, uh, sizes, grades, and wall thicknesses. Uh, and connection types to much different wellbore conditions. Uh, depending on its exact location in the well, the casing performs different functions. It can be a conductor, it's the uppermost casing, which supports unconsolidated surface formations and prevents damage at the very top of the well, where it meets the seabed or the cellar, depending if you are offshore or, or on land. Another type of casing is the surface casing, which provides support for the weight of the wellhead and blowout preventer, or BOP, uh, stack, while protecting uh, shallow water horizons and supporting unstable formation. Um, another uh, type of uh, casing is intermediate casing, which isolates troublesome formations above the reservoir section. Moving uh, further in, you also have production casing, this is the deepest casing string and protects the production string, the production tubing, uh, sorry, which uh, brings the hydrocarbons to surface. And uh, of course, there is a, the liner, uh, another uh, type of uh, casing, uh, which is a short casing string that does not extend all the way to the surface. Its top is just inside the previous casing, and it can be used against drilling problems or as an extension of the production casing. Now, casing generally ends up with cement on its external surface. Uh, after it is installed, with multiple strings inside uh, each other, giving a well the characteristic shape of an inverted telescope. Uh, and this is the result of the well construction process that we'll present next. Uh, uh, before that, we have to say that there are, uh, in order to explain the process, we should first understand that there are different types of wells. There are exploration wells, sometimes called wildcats drilled in a previously unexplored area. Generally, nine out of 10 such wells prove unsuccessful or dry. Uh, the well design may or may not include the requirement for a well test in case of success. Uh, the well test is to produce for a short time to evaluate the reservoir properties. Exploration wells are plugged and abandoned before the rig moves away. So this is one type of well. Another type of well is appraisal well. Uh, appraisal wells are drilled after an exploration well confirms the existence of hydrocarbons in an area. They are used to assess the extent of a reservoir and to collect data revealing its potential value. These appraisal wells may later become development wells, provided they have been designed with this purpose in mind, but not always. And the third type of wells is development wells. It, they can be producers or injectors and are built to last 20 years, 30 years. Uh, injectors are used to maintain 
obtain uh, or uh, augment the reservoir pressure by injecting water or other fluids. Sometimes injector wells are used to dispose slurified drill cuttings uh, by injecting them into a suitable formation. Now, uh, having said that, let's look at the drilling uh, process. Uh, the first is that we spud in the well, uh, start making hole using a uh, large drill bit and a simple uh, drilling fluid, often called spud mud. We start drilling ahead, rotate and circulate deepen in the hole through very weak formations. A large amount of cuttings uh, arrive at the surface very fast. And then we drill to first casing seat, where we're going to set casing. We stop drilling at that point after entering a stronger formation that can withstand pressure from a potential kick. And this is where we set the first casing. So this is what happens then. Uh, uh, we uh, pull out of the hole, which is called the trip, take the drill string out of the hole, run the first casing, leaving some space at the bottom to facilitate circulation. Um, then uh, we pump cement. Start pumping cement inside the casing until reaching uh, uh, the pre-calculated volume necessary to fill its uh, external annulus. Then we displace the cement behind casing. After pumping the required amount of cement, we continue pumping drilling fluid to push the cement outside the casing and into the annulus. Only at the bottom of the casing string, called the casing shoe, there will be some cement left inside the casing. Uh, a good cement recipe is tailored so that the cement slurry starts becoming hard only after pumping has stopped. So you don't want premature setting of the cement. Uh, after we have done that, we drill ahead to second casing seat. This happens when the cement is, is hard and a new smaller drill bit is used to drill out the casing uh, shoe and then continue drilling new formation until the intended depth uh, where the second casing will be installed. This point is selected to keep risk of hydrocarbon presence to an absolute minimum because the blowout preventers have not yet been installed. Uh, at that point, we run the second casing string to the bottom like previously. Then we pump and display cement behind casing and install the blowout preventer. Uh, the cement casing, um, uh, th sorry, the blowout preventer is installed uh, at the top of the casing string. This consists of a combination of special valves designed to seal and control flow from the well in case of emergency. The integrity of the casing and, uh, is usually confirmed with a pressure test. The integrity of the BOP is confirmed with regular pressure and function tests that, that we do uh, while we drill the well every 14 days at the most. Um, then uh, we drill through uh, the reservoir to total depth. We pick a, an even smaller bit which can fit through the BOP uh, and the second uh, casing drill out the casing shoe and continue drilling through virgin formations. A little further down, we start penetrating the reservoir, which has a higher pressure than the formation just above it and contains typically gas at the top, oil in the middle, and water at the bottom. Not always, but this is a typical uh, configuration. We continue drilling to create a pocket below the reservoir, which is used to accommodate the logging tools that will be run later. Now, uh, what what we do ne uh, next is pull out of the hole to run electric logs. We take the drill uh, string out of the hole and run a logging suite on Y line to obtain directional uh, geological information. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. Then we run the production liner, assuming this was designed as an exploration well, uh, to test the reservoir flow potential. We run a liner. Um, which is a casing whose top is just inside the previous casing and secured in place with a liner hanger. We do that by putting in the hole the required length of liner and then run it down to the required depth on drill pipe. We then cement the liner like we cement casing. Then the next phase is to complete the well. To prepare for the well test, we run a tubing to just inside the liner with a packer externally. We test the well after perforating the liner at uh, reservoir depth using uh, explosive charges. 
uh, run through the tubing. We let the well flow on and off while recording data like pressure, temperature, flow rate, pressure, uh, build up rate, etc. Uh, such data can help us to estimate the reservoir characteristics. And after we do that, we plug and abandon the well. Irrespective of the result of the well test, we then start removing tubing and casing sections that can be removed. We pump cement plugs and permanently abandon the well in a safe uh, condition, meaning hydrocarbons can't escape the, uh, to the environment or other underground formations. Um, now, uh, a little bit more about directional drilling. Uh, at the dawn of the oil and gas industry, all wells used to be vertical, like the one that we just saw. Nowadays, most wells are directional. Uh, now, why do we need directional wells? To reach different accumulations from one platform offshore or one drilling pad or land is one uh, reason. Another reason is to drain a reservoir better by increasing its contact area with the well by drilling horizontal wells. Uh, another reason is to intercept and kill a well that is blowing out by drilling a relief well. This is what happened with Macondo, if you, uh, if you remember. Another reason uh, to, to drill um, uh, direction wells is to, to drill multilateral wells in order to drain different parts of the same reservoir with fewer wells. Uh, another reason is to reach a reservoir located under an accessible location, like a city. Uh, or to drill a side track from a main well bore for operational or geological reasons. Uh, now, you may ask yourself, how, how do we know what we're drilling through? One way to find out for sure what we're drilling through is to bring a big piece of rock, not just drill cuttings, out of the hole and to the surface. We achieve that by cutting a cylindrical piece of formation using core bit which has a hollow center. This is what you see here. Um, another way uh, to measure properties of the rock after drilling uh, the hole using special sensors run uh, in, the, uh, in the hole on Y-line. We can do that. Um, you see here, you know, it's a slumber Z track. You know, this was the first company that uh, started doing that. Uh, it still exists today. Uh, now, uh, today, uh, we can uh, um, take such measurements while drilling too, not only after drilling, but while drilling too, with a suite of tools, with a suite of tools uh, under the general name of MWD, measurement while drilling, and LWD, logging while drilling. Such measurements do not only reveal the characteristics of formation and reservoir, but also the exact shape and location of the well bow. Um, now, um, what are we trying to ultimately determine uh, from these measurements? Uh, here is some uh, characteristics of the formation that we try to measure. Porosity. Porosity is, are the voids that hold fluids, oil, gas, and or water. Another characteristic is saturation. Saturation is the volume of each fluid contained in the voids. Uh, when we say each fluid, we mean uh, gas, water, or oil. Uh, another one uh, is permeability. Permeability is, means how connected are the voids so that the fluids move through the formation. And of course, fluid properties, you know, it's what kind of fluid it is. Is it oil, gas, water, and how does it flow? So some basic log logging measurements are uh, resistivity logs, which differentiate between salty water and hydrocarbons, oil and gas, porosity logs, uh, which is the percentage of pore uh, volume voids in the rock, density logs, which is the bulk density of the formation, another way to calculate porosity, sonic logs, percentage of uh, pore volume in the rock, and gamma ray, natural radiation determining rock type, sand, limestone, or shale. All these and more are brought together in Archie's equation that calculates the volume of hydrocarbons. Here is the Archie's equation, as you can see. Uh, there you will see water saturation, uh, um, uh, hydrocarbon saturation, porosity, uh, 
formation water resistivity, bulk uh, resistivity measured by the login tools, and different constants uh, taking into account various phenomena and uh, like a m and n and, and these their values are are, are around one two uh, uh, etc um, now finally here's an example of uh, the output of a, a login run with uh, colorful uh, wiggly lines that convey lots of useful information uh, you see depth uh, formation gamma ray resistivity uh, uh, resistivity versus density, uh, density, sonic, image logs, and composite logs. Um, I won't go into more detail. What I will say here is that uh, um, this uh, presentation covers the technical breadth of drilling and completions, but merely scratches the surface of their technical and operational depth. Um, uh, Constructing a service in a well in the oil field is an activity that requires a multidisciplinary approach. Many technical disciplines co uh, cooperate throughout the well's life cycle. Geologists, geophysicists, petrophysicists, reservoir engineers, production technologists, uh, completion engineers and drilling engineers, subsea engineers, uh, also HSE advisors, which are an uh, integral part of the team, and many more. And also several non-technical functions are also required to support the well operations, uh, logistics, contracting, procurement, human resources, security, etc. Uh, due to the high technical and operational complexity of well operations, all professionals involved in these activities uh, need not only depth in their own specialism, but also breadth. Uh, that is sufficient understanding of how all these pieces fit together in order to perform their jobs successfully. The overarching priority in drilling and completion is to keep risks uh, to health, safety, and environment as low as reasonably practicable, a, co a concept known by its acronym ALARP. Um, so this concept informs all technical and non-technical decisions uh, during a world's life uh, cycle. Well, construction professionals are indoctrinated to this approach early on, drilling being an, uh, at the call phase of the hydrocarbon industry. Uh, it is usually the last defense against HSE incidents, which explains the huge focus on drilling, of drilling and completions uh, uh, people on safety, health, and environment issues. Despite the increasing complexity of hydrocarbon extraction, this ALARP concept has contributed to the continuous improvement observed by the HSE performance in the HSE performance of the oil and gas industry globally. That concludes my presentation. Okay, if that's the presentation finished, I'll, uh, I'll thank you for that. It certainly covered a lot of different subjects. So, Jan, in there, Chrysanthus? Yes. Excellent. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. That's great. We've we've got a couple of questions already, uh, and if I could ask the audience to put in any further questions as we go through this session, uh, that would be great. Um, so the first question is uh, to do with the mud. Um, how do you prevent the drilling mud from contaminating the oil or the gas or whatever whatever you're drilling from? So how do you prevent the oil and uh, gas getting prevented, getting damaged by the mud? So um, we have to understand that um, there is a, a pressure balance uh, downhole, or we try to have a pressure balance. So uh, the, the oil, for example, is in a reservoir and it has a certain pressure. So what we try to do is to keep uh, this pressure balanced with the, the hydrostatic pressure of, of our mud that we have in the in the well. So it cannot be uh, it it can our hydrostatic pressure cannot be 
lower than the reservoir pressure of the oil uh, because then we're going to have a kick but it cannot be too high because it, then it may um, uh, break the formation and, and destabilize the formation now I, I guess the question is how do we prevent the mud continuously flowing into the reservoir uh, and uh, and uh, invading the, the reservoir with mud and filling it with mud so um, the, the answer to this is that um, uh, 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 our drilling mud has uh, uh, some chemicals and some uh, you know uh, components which create what we call a filter cake uh, this is uh, like a semi permeable let's say filter uh, you know of, of a few millimeters thickness depending on, on the composition of the fluid and also of our formation uh, which um, uh, it's like a membrane that, that that stops a lot of movement and also I, I have to say that even if there is some uh, uh, invasion of, of mud into the oil this is the first thing that is produced when you bring the well online so it is a very short-lived phenomenon okay that sounds good yeah so so when the when the mud comes up against a permeable formation you get a certain amount of uh, spot losses and then it forms a cake on the outside of that formation yeah okay yep. thank you for that we've got a second question here uh, how do you control the direction of the horizontal drilling? So this is a question on directional drilling. Uh, yeah. So um, in the past, <laughs> in the past, directional drilling was a little bit like a, a black art. You know, it was uh, uh, there was a lot of mystery around it, uh, like uh, you know, to the, for the common people. Now there is a, uh, nowadays there is a, a lot more uh, science and also a lot of experience that has been accumulated. Um, uh, you, we control in two ways. We know the mechanical response of our components. So, for instance, if you have a mud motor, it has it, it's a little bit bent in its uh, in its uh, body. So we know that uh, it de depending on how we direct it uh, downhole. Depend, remember, the mud motor is the case where uh, you make a directional hole without rotating your string. Uh, what rotates is the, the mud motor itself through uh, the hydraulic power of the flowing mud. So in this case, you direct your your uh, by rotating your drill string in a certain direction. You direct the bent uh, part of the motor in the direction you want to drill in, um, and this is how you you uh, you go into a certain direction. Now, how 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 do you know how much you have moved in the direction you want? You have, as we said, uh, different. Uh, uh, we take different measurements in the bottom hole assembly, uh, and one of these measurements is the directional measurements that, that we take. So, uh, every time we stop to make a connection, we take these uh, surveys, and then we know how much we have moved in and in which direction. Uh, in the case of the um, of, of the rotary steerables tools, which is the other. Um, the other option, you know, for drilling directional wells, uh, mud motor rotary steerables, we take, uh, we can also take continuous measurements of the of the uh, of the of the direction of the uh, of the hole, as we make. And uh, you, you remember, we said that in this case, you don't uh, you don't have to direct your drill thing in a certain way because it rotates all the time. But a servo mechanism, uh, which you um, direct from the from the top. You uh, uh, will rotate the or will direct the, the your motor in the or your 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 uh, bottom hole assembly in the in the direction you uh, by design you know that you have by design. So uh, and again when you stop uh, to 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 make a connection you, uh, uh, of the drill pipe, you, uh, I remind you that the connection is is you know you basically have to screw. A, a, a length of drill pipe on top of each other. Every time you stop to do that, generally you take a survey and you know in which direction you moved. Excellent. Okay, we've got another question here on uh, rig selection. So, could, can you explain what are the criteria for choosing a drilling rig for the offshore operation? Uh, so, this is the, the choice of the actual rig. Right. So, so for the uh, if we're talking about offshore rigs, um, 
there there are a number of uh, criteria. First of all, you have to know um, uh, the you know the pressure capability. <clears throat> so, what kind of pressure uh, pressures your rig will have to to deal with? Uh, so, if if you are uh, in a if if you have let's say um, a reservoir which may give you up to 10,000 um, uh, psi, for example, then you you have to to select a rig that has this capability to uh, uh, to contain a kick of 10,000 psi, for example. Uh, the other one is uh, how deep your well is going to be. So how much pipe do you have to to run? How much uh, drill string? How how long is going to be? And also sometimes the direction plays a role because the more direction your well is, the more torque and drag you're going to have. So you make some mod, you you run some models, and you see what kind of uh, strength your your rig uh, needs uh, in order to to uh, uh, to drill, and then to run the completion, run, uh, or run the the the, the casing, uh, and and all and all this. And also, uh, an, an extreme case would be, for instance, also when you get stuck. If you get stuck, how how much of, of a of, you know how much power do you need to 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 to, to free the to free your uh, string? Uh, specifically for offshore, if we're talking about shallow offshore, um, the, where you have the territory of the of the uh, jackups, um, you want to see. Uh, whether your your jack up your, uh, you know is going to be strong enough to hold position with with its legs and also whether your spud guns are going to to be you're going to be able to you know to give it stability also avoid any uh, shallow hazards that you can have on the on the drill uh, on the on the on the seabed therefore you do some uh, preliminary investigations you know shallow geotechnical investigations uh, and you and you see what kind of spud guns uh, you need you you need there. Uh, um, any um, uh, uh, hazards or or environmental uh, um, uh, you know like um, uh, uh, considerations that you can have. You know sometimes you, you can be. I remember when I was in uh, Brunei, we had to avoid uh, locations where there were corals, for example. Um, and, and also, if you have any uh, kind of um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, like environmental conditions that that, that may uh, overload your the legs of your jackup, you know, uh, different um, streams and things like that. Now, going more or deeper, or so it becomes um, uh, easier because then uh, you need to uh, to think about environmental conditions. Uh, and, and you, you try to have uh, to to to, you, uh, to um, plan for the for the worst possible conditions that you can see. And we have seen uh, some rigs have been built on purpose, you know, with these kind of conditions in uh, in uh, mind. And these conditions could be um, uh, very high seas. Uh, it can be uh, uh, currents. Uh, and very strong currents. There are some some times, you know, you have you have very strong currents, and and uh, your uh, thrusters for the drill ships ca can hardly cope. Um, so this is uh, this is another uh, another uh, reason, uh, you know, um, criteria why why you would uh, uh, choose a certain rig type. These are the technical uh, uh, the technical uh, criteria. You also have the commercial criteria. So you try to do this at, uh, at, at the most economical price uh, when you take all your risks into account. So it's a, it's a, sometimes it, it has to be a risk-based decision. Uh, and of course, um, quality uh, assurance uh, of your rig and, and its components plays a very important role. So it is, it, it is a complicated subject. I try to, to very briefly uh, uh, list some of them. Uh, criteria. I hope it, it didn't sound too complicated. Yeah, it sounds as though there's a, a good list of things that need to be considered in that one. So staying on the, the drilling theme and the directional drilling, um, on the drill pipe, is there a need for flexible joints in the drill string or is the angle limited to the flexibility of the drill pipe itself? 
Um, and if it is, what is the maximum angle that can actually be applied while doing the directional drawing? Uh, you know, uh, it, it's. Uh, I understand the question. Uh, you know where it comes from, but we have to think. Now the drill string itself is 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 very flexible. Uh, it, it's like um, I, I, you know, in my mind, it's like a spaghetti. Uh, uh, you know, like a piece of spaghetti. If you think that you know we have like a, a, a well, it can be you know between thousand and six thousand meters, and you have a, a drill string that is like I don't know five inch, uh, 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 th uh, you know, or, or external diameter. Uh, this is very flexible by itself. So, um, and, and it is designed, the drill string and the components are designed for, for this kind of uh, conditions, you know, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and loads. But, by, but, but um, uh, as, as a whole, the, the drill string is very flexible. Where it becomes less flexible is when you start introducing uh, 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 like fatter components, and this is close to the to the to the bottom of the string where you have the bottom hole assembly, and you try to add the components like um, uh, 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 collars, you know, that are becoming locally uh, more uh, stiffer. Um, and and in this case, you know, when you try to to sometimes, you know, in some well designs, we we try to build angle very fast, and you have what we call locally high dog legs, uh, and, and in this case, the, the stiffness of the, of your bottom hole assembly can become a, a problem, and then you try to make it less stiff, or you try to to make it shorter so that it doesn't get uh, stuck in the in the high angles. But uh, so my my answer to the question is 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 that it, the stiffness is much of the drill string is much less of a problem than we think originally because we think about the drill string as a as a short length but it's a very long length yeah i remember in my uh in my own experience we ended up drilling a a section in order to get onto the target and it was about six degrees per hundred feet we got managed to achieve in order to hit the target which was which was fine but getting the completion down there was about a bunch of fun Okay, yeah, that, that, that's more of a problem, you know, in the stiffness. It, it's the completion rather than the drilling. That's because right. Then, yeah, yeah. Mm. When, once you drill the hole, you've then got to complete it, and that's a, that can be a bit difficult if you've got screens. Okay, so look into the future a wee bit. We've got a couple of questions here. Uh, are there any significant challenges for converting oil and gas reservoirs for storing carbon dioxide? And uh, Christopher, who's asked the question, says, you know, this has been done. Enhanced recovery at the Sleipner uh, field in Norway. Uh, are there any learnings from this? Uh, I'm not a specialist in, in this area. Uh, in principle, if a reservoir could hold um, um, gas, for example, for millennia, and it is a good seal, and you have not damaged the seal, you know, by uh, you know bad practices or, or you know like while producing. In principle, I think you could uh, store CO2 in there. Um, my my personal, and this is not, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a non-specialist uh, comment. This my my concern is um, um, liabilities over the long term. You know, so if you have we have a, 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 a place where there is a lot of CO2, um, how do we deal with the future? You know, uh, liabilities that can come from this. You know. You know, there, there may be I don't know some kind of a tectonic event, uh, and then you you have uh, this uh, CO CO2 released somehow. That's 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 my only um, you know non-technical kind kind of uh, concern. But uh, in principle, I, if if a reservoir could hold gas before, I don't see why it wouldn't uh, call, uh, hold CO2. Um, you could use the same. Uh, wells refurbished that used to produce the gas uh, in order to re-inject, or you could do new wells to re to, yep. to inject the, the CO2. Yeah, I saw I saw an excellent presentation on this very subject. It was at the Society of Petroleum Engineers. There was a CCUS conference uh, held just just earlier this month, 
and there was actually a paper written on that, and I can't remember who it was. But um, if you if you actually if you go into uh, the Society of Petroleum Engineers Aberdeen section and search their website, I think you'll be able to find some information on this very subject. Just from memory, there was a couple of issues. Uh, they had to be careful if there was actually an event where they had a blowout because the temperature would go so slow, so low, and that would, might have a problem with the metal. And then the second thing was the carbon dioxide can create carbonic acid when it's in, in contact with water, so you end up with a bunch of uh, corrosion questions there. But mm -hmm. Society of Petroleum Engineers got a bunch of information on that subject. Um, and we've got time for one or two other questions. Uh, and this one's very similar. Can depleted oil and wells, oil and gas wells, be repurposed to extract geothermal energy? I I think that um, um, geothermal. I think it, it's a it's a very uh, very good question this one because um, it could be an easy win. What do I mean? When we have to, uh, you know, as you know, we have to abandon wells at the end of their life mm -hmm. uh, anyway but if we uh, instead of abandoning wells if we uh, uh, the, the economics work in the economics of where will this uh, um, geothermal energy and how it's going to be converted to what and how it's going to be distributed if the economics work I don't see why uh, why we you know we shouldn't seriously look at at uh, uh, turning um, uh, oil and gas fields into geothermal fields for existing uh, for existing uh, fields, but also um, uh, apart apart from repurposing old fields, uh, I think geothermal energy has also its own potential for for new wells. I know there is a, a, a you know a scaling uh, problem. Uh, you know, I, I have looked into this quite a bit, and, and I think that there are uh, quite um, quite good scholarly articles on this. Uh, but I think geothermal energy, and especially for old uh, repurposing old fields, it, it looks to me like like a low hanging fruit, like an easy win, until we find uh, uh, solutions to, to for the scaling issue. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. As once again, I saw a presentation on this and uh, on some geothermal work for SPE. And the thing, the big thing for me was that if you're drilling a geothermal well, it's a much bigger well bore. You know, they're talking about something like seven inch production tubing in order to get the volume of hot fluid up. But as you say, if the well is drilled in the first place, then why not use it? You know, why not just uh, repurpose it and save you a lot of money in the actual drilling process? Well, thank you, Cathensis. Uh, it is now one o'clock, and uh, we have actually come to the end of our question. So, thanks for that presentation, and uh, we hope to get some more information from you another time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Thanks.